Good morning and uh, welcome to the i3 webinar with uh, Jenison Associates, where we will discuss the structural changes and opportunities in uh, the China's healthcare system. I'm a Tech 10 with i3, and I'm pleased to have uh, Sarah Moreno join us today. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Pleasure. Uh, so Sarah is a, an emerging markets uh, equity portfolio manager and research analyst. Uh, she joined Jenison in 2011, uh, and she previously covered stocks in Latin America, emerging Eastern Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, it's worth noting that during her time on the sell side, she covered healthcare services and uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, specifically that included you know, US managed care, uh, PBMs or pharmacy benefit managers, ophthalmology, dermatology, and uh, specialty pharmaceuticals. So enter today's topic, you know, you know, when we think about biotechnology, we're well aware that uh, the US is you know, obviously the leading superpower in this area. Uh, but I suspect most of us may not be aware that China has become an increasingly important player in uh, biotechnology or two. So for a long time, you know, the domestic Chinese uh, pharmaceutical industry has been one of uh, generic drug manufacturing, while much of the R&D um, took place in, say, in Europe and in the US. Uh, but that's no longer the case. Um, why? In, in fact, I was surprised to, to learn that China has gone from a generic market where you know, they copy some of the drugs from uh, first world countries to better versions of the same drug to best in class and now potentially uh, first in class. So, so in the next 40 minutes or so, we will delve deeper into this transformation and what it means for investors. Now, in, in terms of format, this will be an informal fireside chat between myself and uh, Sarah. Um, whilst I have a list of uh, prepared questions, uh, I'll encourage you, the audience, to submit questions via the question box on, on this app, and we'll endeavor to answer them in the course of the conversation. Uh, and for a final disclaimer, this webinar is for, in, for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice and it's intended for wholesale and institutional investors only. So Sarah, uh, welcome again. Um, to, to begin, let's, let's set the context. I think as I alluded in the introduction, um, I must admit I was surprised by the transformation uh, and the growth potential and some of the numbers that we see. So perhaps you can help us set the context. I mean, what is this transformation and, and why? Sarah? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the time and thank you everyone for making the time to, to join us. So I think what the what is the premise is obviously we're taking a bottom-up active approach to investing in emerging markets, but what we've seen over time is a paradigm shift where you know you're seeing innovation and and the leveraging of technology, you know, the, the invention of the smartphone really has unleashed a lot of opportunity for companies at a local level to really optimize and find opportunities to serve the local market. And in this regard, China led the way, for example, in e-commerce. Uh, we now see that now there's, you know, uh, medium, short form, long form videos, community buying, there's just more innovative ways of engagement online that we haven't even really explored in, in the West. Really, China's been at the forefront of that really leapfrogging um, into a next level of growth and to create more inclusion for, for its society. Um, and But one of the areas that we have seen a very speedy catch up, if you will, has been in healthcare. And I think really what's driving is this paradigm shift in, across emerging markets where you really, for an active investor that's looking for differentiated um, companies, you really can find uh, pockets of growth that's been led by innovation and disruptive technology. Mm. And, and Sarah, if you go deeper into that, um, what's, what's driving this change? Are there factors, I think, whether it's demographics, um, availability of capital? Can, can you elaborate a bit more? What's, what's actually driving specifically the, this, this change? Yeah, so within healthcare, really what drove the, the, the shift is back in 2015, as China was looking at the next five, 10 years of growth, what it was gonna look like, what the government needed to focus in. I think they really zeroed in on eight key industries and one of those was pharmaceuticals. What they saw coming was the aging of the population in China, the higher, in, and with that comes higher incidence of chronic diseases such as cancer, but other kinds of diseases as well. And also the fact 
that the system was still too generic and not enough innovation has been had been brought forth. So what the Chinese government did very quickly is they did a few things. They they reformed the entire healthcare system, pushing companies to innovate, forcing, for example, bioequivalents. All companies needed if you were going to put a drug to the market that was generic, it actually needed to be bioequivalent to the branded version. That actually did not happen until after 2015 in China. So there was a lot of me too's, but some of them were very low quality. So on top of the fact there was a generic market, it wasn't of a high quality, um, high mm -hmm. quality generic market. And then what really drove the change was when China uh, reformed its system, reformed, you know, like I said, bioequivalence, really brought forth better clinical um, technology, reformed the, the, the Chinese the equivalent of the FDA, Chinese FDA, and was able to join ICH. This is the international body that regulates clinical trials. By being able to join ICH, then you could actually take trials done in China to the US or have or be part of trials that are global out of China. And this was a meaningful shift in the ability for, for the China healthcare market to participate in, in the global healthcare market. Right. The other thing that really drove the change was in June of 20, that was in June 2017. And in early 2018, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange allowed for the um, IPOing of pre-revenue, pre-profit companies, which was able to unleash the biotech industry. All that capital that was trapped was able mm -hmm. to really find, uh, find opportunities and to really then therefore brought talent from the West back right. to China to to you know leverage this amazing opportunity that China had to offer, led by that aging demographic and the need, the very urgent unmet need of its population, given the high incidence of a lot of uh, chronic diseases in China. I, I guess that probably explains that, that shift from you know uh, this cheap or generics uh, moving up the the food chain, if if you like, uh, because of the availability of talent, as you mentioned. It, so these are. Um, what Chinese nationals moving back to to Hong Kong and, and China with the the right skill set that has not yes. made a difference. Yes, there was a big uh, influx of of expatriates, but actually not only just um, Chinese born or chi of Chinese origin, mm -hmm. but also Western um, you know executives who saw the opportunity that that China had to offer. I mean, scientists uh, could see that you know, one of the largest pools of, of naive cancer patients was in China. And that the opportunity to be able to bring these therapies for the local market and really create local and companies to serve that market was a great opportunity. So you see a, 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 almost a cross-pollination of talent. Some has come, some has come back because the opportunity has been so vast and other is, you know, looking bringing back the expertise of china to the u.s market and that's that's the future we're starting to see some of that where companies are creating therapies in china and western companies are in licensing them in for the global market and so that's sort of the next phase that we're getting to and that that's where you know it, it gets quite mm -hmm. exciting so i guess you're seeing uh, clinical trials obviously happening in china obviously with the vast population um, and you mentioned, I guess this is more unfortunate in the sense the one of the factors is the increasing prevalence of chronic diseases like like cancer. Yes. What does that mean again for you know, the biotech or the pharmaceutical industry in, in China? Yeah, so there's a lot of forces going into that. What, what we saw in the West is, you know, for example, for a condition like cancer, you started with chemotherapy. That was sort of the, the general, uh, you're starting uh, therapy you're to, to try to cure the or limit the progression of the disease. Then you, um, the West came up with what is called monoclonal antibodies. These are live cells that really activate your, the body's own immune response to fight the cancer. So it's a, it's a drug class called PD-1. And you know you might know them, Keytruda, Updevo, the commercials are on, I, I don't know, in Australia, but in the US, they're pretty <laughs> frequent. Um, so these are the types of drugs that were developed. They're the next level of drugs. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened in, in China is that they were able to leverage that scientific technology to create the localized PD-1s. And in some cases, some of the PD-1s have, have, have slightly better safety or longevity versus some of the existing drugs for certain types of, of, of diseases. So a PD, mm -hmm. not everybody that gets cancer is able to use a PD-1 drug. So when you think about in China, there's about 4.6 million people that have that get cancer every year. Of that, about maybe 3.4, 3.6 million are eligible for the PD-1. It's how your body can, if your body can react to that type of therapy. And so 
you constantly have to have new therapies and increasingly right. what we're going towards is therapies that address your specific type of biomarker are you are you know as you as diseases progress then more therapists are given for that disease. And so that's the ongoing cross-pollination that you're seeing now out of the U.S. and China, where some uh, therapies are being brought locally for the Chinese market for that specific type of disease or condition, but they also serve the U.S. market. So there's a cross-pollination of, of not just the trials, but also the types of drugs that are being invented for these types of therapies. So there's a lot of opportunity in that interaction. And right. that's why the talent has moved, has really kind of shifted both ways to uh, to bring forth um, these therapies because the trials now really are global. You need, you need, some of the populations are bigger here in the US, but increasingly in China, like I said, there's more people with cancer. So there's more need to have trials localized in China. Right. And again, without getting too technical, you talk about monoclonal antibodies um, and that's differentiated against chemical drugs, which is, I guess, more traditional yes. drugs. So a chemical drug is basically it's a synthetic compound that you come up with in a lab, whereas a biological drug is literally live cells that are cultured from a small vial into big batches. And uh, it, it actually is the therapy is within the agent that goes into your body to try to activate your immune cell response within your body. So that's it, it really is the next generation of therapies where you're really trying to attack the tumor at its core. Whereas with chemotherapy, you, you actually are hurting the cells around it as well. And so you're killing mm. the good cells as well as the bad cells. That's why people get very sick from chemotherapy. This is a more targeted therapy, attacking the cells at the site of the tumor and not, mm. not affecting those around it. And that's that's really where the focus has been over the last, um, in the U.S. over the last decade, but really increasingly in China in, in finding not just monoclonal antibodies, which is one drug, mm -hmm. but now combinations of drugs with chemotherapy, without, with other um, chemical drugs to really mm -hmm. attack specifically at the site of the tumor, depending upon the type of cancer it is, of course. Right, right. So I, I guess that, that probably relates to, you know, your remark that at, at the global level, um, we are at what you call it a global age of a uh, a golden age of uh, biological drugs. Yeah, so increasingly what's happening is that more and more of the global clinical pipeline is being driven by the development of these biological drugs. So when you think about, you know, all the clinical trials that are in, in the world, about 58% uh, of them are small molecules, but now increasingly the bigger, the bigger pie is these biological drugs that are being developed across the clinical trial. And what's interesting about the development of biological drugs is, as you can imagine, it, it is much harder to copy a live cell, a vial of live cells, than it is to copy a synthetic drug, right? That just goes down a full line and gets reproduced many, many times. That is a much complex process. So what this, this need and this demand and, uh, for these biological drugs has led is that it has led to a partnership between not just the science, but also the companies that can help manufacture and mass produce these biological drugs. And that's been another interesting investment opportunity within healthcare. And that's, again, a global opportunity because the global pipeline of, of biological drugs is, is the fastest growing component of all the drugs that are being that are in the clinical pipeline. Yeah, I think that that's a, that's a nice segue. I know we've, we've covered quite a bit on the technical, the, the, the healthcare issues. Um, sort of good segue into what the investment, whether it's the opportunity, the implications are. I guess, again, from a layman perspective, you know, we know the, the big brand names in drugs, mainly US and European names. Um, what's the emerging market? What's the Chinese? You know, are there are there emerging Chinese companies that, that are taking you know, this technology globally? How do we look at it in, in the context of an investment strategy? Yeah, so we've identified the biggest pocket of growth. I mean, because of the investment level that's now that we see an uptick in China, I mean, China only spends 5% of GDP on healthcare versus the 17 plus percent in, in the US, for example. So there's still a big delta of investment. And within that, there's obviously vast opportunities. But we think that because of the high incidence of cancer, that oncology and the development of these biological drugs is going to be one of the fastest growth components of healthcare. And we see that because the need is local, but the use can also be global. And I think when you think about uh, an, an optimal way of starting to invest in the sector, it's really playing it via the um, the, the companies such as Wuxi Biologics that are that are 
participating in the biotech opportunity in China because they're the partner of choice to help not just discover and help them through clinical trials, but eventually to manufacture these biological drugs. And so there, that's a way to invest in that opportunity. But like I said, because the global pipeline of biological drugs is growing so rapidly, it's not only Chinese biotechs that are partnering with companies with these contract discovery manufacturing organizations like Wuxi, and people probably are familiar with Lanza, um, that it's also the global pharmaceuticals, the global biotechs, the who's who, you know, your Eli Lilies that, that, are, that are partnering with CDMOs to also speed up and actually access lower cost and actually talent too. So there's three layers of, of the opportunities big, but talent is hard to come by, um, of which China has an abundance uh, currently. Um, the cost benefit that you have uh, by producing some of these batches in, in China. And the third is that it's the global opportunity, the speed to market that a CDMO can give you. And that's obviously very crucial for any company, especially in pharma, because mm -hmm. everybody's running clinical trials at the same time and it's a race to get to market first. And so if there's a way to leverage or to speed that process up, that your people are going to maximize that, and that's what a CDMO um, allows you to do. So one of the most dearest way to do that is to via these CDMOs and CROs that are enabling and speeding up the time to market for these biological drugs. So that would be a first layer. A second layer is obviously directly in companies like Innovent, like Beijing, Johnson Hongre, who um, is your is one of the oldest, has one of the oldest oncology franchises in China and successfully has shifted from a generic to a to an innovative led company. But then you have your pure biotech such as Innovent, Beijing, Junxi, who have really been at the forefront of bringing the PD-1, that first class of biological drugs to China. And what you're seeing is their success is evident not just in how quickly they were able to bring the drugs to market in the Chinese market, but also the partnerships they've been able to form with Western companies who want access to the Chinese market. You know, Beijing with Amgen and Novartis, uh, Innovent with Eli Lilly, um, Jushi also with Eli Lilly. So that's been very, very exciting and interesting to see. And I think it shows mm -hmm. to your earlier point that it's not just a cheap manufacturing mm -hmm. copy uh, type of environment in China healthcare anymore. There is true innovation occurring. Uh, and, and so it's a very exciting time uh, to be an active investor in, in China healthcare. So you had a couple of acronyms, I thought, again, for the benefit of our audience, you mentioned CDMO and CRO, are these sort of outsourcing type arrangements? Yes, so a CDMO is a contract discovery manufacturing organization and a CRO is a clinical research organization. The difference is that a clinical research organization really helps you through the clinical trial process. A CMO, a clinical manufacturing organization, just helps you. So if you think of the beginning of the chain to the end, it's discovery all the way to commercial. Um, and so you can have specialists that help you, that you can outsource to at any part of that chain. What's unique about Wuxi Biologics is they are an end-to-end -end solution from discovery all the way to commercialization. It's one of the most unique characteristics of that company because unlike Lanza, which is more of a CMO, contract manufacturer organization, you don't get the, the participation of that early discovery phase. By following the molecule, which is a follow the molecule strategy of Wuxi Biologics, mm -hmm. as an investor, you're participating in the entire chain because the company is participating in the entire chain. So I think that makes it one of the most unique companies in that space, in that outsourcing space. And that mm -hmm. is in itself one of the biggest levers of growth for, for the entire industry, the CMO, CRO, CDMO industry, is that more mm -hmm. and more companies, not just in China, but globally, are partnering with, uh, you know, the outsourcing trend is growing double digits. And so that in sure. alone is a big leg of growth for these companies. And increasingly, mm -hmm. Chinese companies are participating, they're growing global because of the depth and the, and the quick uptake that we've seen in clinical trial activity out of China from a local and a global level. And so they've gained the expertise very quickly. And now they're looking beyond China to become global players. And so there's opportunity there as, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess talking about, you know, um, globalization and outsourcing and so on, um, you know, often we hear in the press, you know, murmurings of, you know, geopolitics. And, and I don't want to get into you know, the, the headlines, uh, but like really just stay at the investment um, level, um, you know, outsourcing and, and there's murmurings of things like deglobalization, uh, trade tensions, you know, threat of sanctions. 
um, and and it I guess it impacts not just biotech. I guess every other conceivable industry that that China has a relationship with. Um, is this going to impact this outsourcing trend and the market opportunity that you talked about, or or is this different? Well, it, it has. It has at different points, especially certainly when geopolitics um, it really peaks um, at different, it, it's had different peaks and valleys. But certainly I recall, I think when this really came to a head was probably in the in the November to 2018, right before the U.S. put uh, tariff sanctions on, on, on China. That was, we're going through that negotiating process. And there was a really hard look taken across every industry. And of course, healthcare was not immune. Um, I remember clearly reading the Department of State, the Department of um, the DOJ's report on healthcare. And there was a big concern about IP protection. And mm. there had been a lot of investment from China directly into biotech startups. And were they taking scientific, you know, hard, hard work, the hard work of the US mm. to, to China? And I think that you really have to break that down and say, well, what what technology does a Wuxi bring to a company that's you know created a new therapy? And and it's it's a it's a cross pollination. There is IP. The platform that Wuxi offers has its own IP, and they're not seeking. They don't ever commercialize their own drugs. There's no conflict of interest with their clients. They just take that vial and create you know and and. Take, make that into a big batch of, of live cells. So there's IP on both sides. And what came out of the report was there really is no stolen uh, right. you know, uh, data that that was not what was occurring, but that there is actually a, a tech transfer both ways. And so that I think it's still a headline risk, but I think the industry understands that in when it comes to CRO CDMOs, maintaining the the IP and protecting the IP of the client is crucial. If, if anybody, you know, loses that, you lose your entire business because it's about reputation and, and maintaining that the, the client's IP. I think where there is concern is, you know, at the, at the lab level, if people are taking, you know, taking data and feeding it to to other entities, you know, that that can happen. But again, the Chinese are focusing on solving the problem of their unmet need. And it's that cross-pollination of scientific research that's really gonna help the whole world. And so I think that in the healthcare space, it's been, okay. it's a headline risk, but it's been a little bit different because the effort is truly, what you're trying to create, your end product is something that would benefit not just the population in China, but the global population. Because lung cancer incidence is high, in the U.S. as it is in China, um, and, and and in some cases the epidemiology is different. So, for example, liver, liver cancer in China is is high because of high incidence of HBV hepatitis. Um, in the U.S., it's it's not because of that. The, the epidemiology is a little bit different. So, in 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 effect, the therapies you would use in the U.S. are not would not be the ones that would work in the Chinese liver cancer population. So, there there's there's still subtle differences. So, it's not just a straight I steal and I can win. You still have to mm. understand the local market and understand the epidemiology of the population you're trying to give therapy to. Yeah, I, I guess from what you're saying, I, I mean, um, U.S. stands, or not just U.S., but Europe or the, the developed countries stand to gain from the research and the trials happening in China. And, and that sort of reminds me, um, of, often again, when we talk geopolitics, the often cited example is the uh, semiconductor uh, industry, the whole race, you know, the quest for 5G leadership, uh, and chips, you know, semiconductor chips, and, and there's more of that, that competition there. Whereas what you're saying is that, um, you know, that there's more of the collaboration because it's, you know, it's in U.S.'s interest, uh, just as it's in China, right. to, to make this, uh, you know, to, to, to work together. Yes, I think it's it's very different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, China needed to catch up and it leverages and it still is leveraging the fact that it does have a large pool of scientists. I mean, they graduate more scientists than, than any other country in the world and they're leveraging mm -hmm. that. And that is what a cost advantage is, is obviously one of their mm -hmm their points of, of their ability to be able to do this so quickly. But I think it mm -hmm. also comes down to the fact that ultimately you're solving the same problem and there's no the, the the win is for the company the win is for everybody to big the bring the therapy as quickly as possible to the population that that is sick um, when it comes to you know the, the the semiconductor industry and all that i think it's about um it, it's about who controls the data and the implications of sure. that so it's very different and and that is a race 
because with data, you, you can do a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. in, in the healthcare space, it's, it's a public good, really. Ultimately, everybody wins if we figure out how to cure cancer, right? If uh, how to cure a HIV, everybody wins from that. And ultimately, um, it's the race to do that to really, um, you know, bring goods that bring a product that the whole world could could benefit from. Obviously, initially, the company wants one company, the companies want to win. And so they're, sure. they're trying to maintain at that edge as, as, as best as possible. But I think ultimately, there's less of a, you know, it, it's not about the, the, the race to get to the data the way it is in, in, in the semiconductor industry. But I think also what's really interesting about what's come out of all this geopolitics is that supply chains have been altered. And there's now really, everyone's taking a hard look at what is your healthcare supply chain? What's your semiconductor supply chain? And there's a portion that will be localized. And obviously from an economist's point of view, that's not optimal, right? Uh, we've all think globalization is is, is mm -hmm. the better way, but um, but I think that from an active investment point of view, it creates winners and losers. It does create opportunity as parts of the all chains, but parts of the healthcare supply chain will also be localized, and that mm -hmm. and you know that we'll see how that evolves as you know mm -hmm. we come out of COVID. But I think COVID has also accelerated that yeah. because it made clear that not only do we need to invest in healthcare, but there are portions of the healthcare chain that need to be localized. Sure. Um, in, in fact, just again, a, a reminder to our audience that, uh, look, I've got a few more questions, but really encourage you to, to ask the question. So I have a question here. In fact, um, a good segue into COVID. Um, I, I guess technically we're still in, in the pandemic, uh, obviously at various levels of progress. Um, um, I, I guess the question here relates to you know, the impact of COVID on the biotech sector. And, and if, my, if I might add, again, without being facetious here, you know, has, has COVID been good? for the biotech sector, you know, given uh, the serious importance that uh, we now attach to vaccines and, and healthcare. Yeah, so I think that has been interesting in that because a company like Wuxi Biologics was already, uh, you know, had the platform to um, to analyze and help companies in the discovery phase, they were actually one of the pioneers in helping a lot of the companies that have come up with potential therapies for COVID. Um, they've been a big participant in that, so they enabled and sped up the time to and to NDA to start on trials. Um, and and that's a testament to the platform that they have, the technology that they have to dis, to to work on discovery of some of mm -hmm. these therapies. Also, they're uh, partnering. Uh, with some of the vaccine manufacturers to try to speed up more vaccine manufacturing. So there's been opportunity created by COVID because of the, the obviously the urgency to get therapies um, in, mm -hmm. through clinical trials and hopefully to commercialization and also to bring forth a vaccine. So you see already that you know the benefit has been tremendous and it came out came from the China side um, and the, some of the science obviously has been coming from the West, but China has played a critical role. Um, and this isn't China, it's a company, right? It's based in China, but it's a global company that's that's mm -hmm. been um, an active participant in resolving that. And I think um, as we're going through the vaccination process and we've seen the need for more supply, there's been ever partnerships being formed between um, companies from the West and Chinese uh, pharmaceuticals to again, bring more capacity uh, to mm. China, but also hopefully to the rest of the world. And China's already been quite active in, in, in gifting, um, you know, its vaccines uh, to, to the rest of the world, especially emerging markets where there's just no, been very limited supply. So there is a bit of, you know, vaccine diplomacy there, but I think it's yep. also just a testament of the, the, the speed <laughs> with which China can participate and bring forth, um, you know, it, not the best. I mean, we know which the best vaccines are. They they came from the West, mm -hmm. but certainly yep. being part of the solution and being able to leverage its technology, know how to bring um, therapies and vaccines to, mm -hmm. to the market. And so it's really um, proven the case that they're not me too and generic anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I had a, a, a recent conversation and, and this relates again to the COVID vaccine and, and that investment dimension of it. And and, and the comment was, you know, the, despite obviously the, the critical importance of developing COVID vaccines, and, and this conversation was probably a year ago be, before Pfizer and the rest came to market, um, I, I was told that the investment opportunity set isn't in COVID vaccines, uh, but rather in other drugs. You know, we, we talked about cancer and diabetes and others. 
uh, because COVID vaccines, while it's important and critical as we speak now, it, it is somewhat of a public good. And, mm -hmm. and commercial companies cannot be seen to be profiting from it. I mean, it's a commercial business, but it cannot be seen. Hence, again, if you put on your investment hat, the, the opportunity set, the investment opportunity set isn't as great as maybe cancer, diabetes and, and the rest. Yeah. Well, I think something that has come out of the vaccine process is now we know that mRNA technology is very, very valuable and that that's mm -hmm. the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. Sure. So it's a whole yeah. new way of coming at creating vaccines. Um, mm -hmm. And so that opens up a very interesting um, opportunity set that some of the Chinese companies are already looking at. They're, they're trying to create, you know, mRNA technology and, and what comes out from that. So I think something that COVID-19 has brought forth is, you know, this this whole new technology that we could we can now harness, but also the need to continue investing in, you know, the next generation of, of drugs. And so the big opportunity that that was already occurring pre-COVID has only been accelerated by COVID. I think COVID just became the accelerant for the types and levels of investment that mm -hmm maybe some some governments, some companies were thinking about doing, and now COVID has accelerated that. And it's not just biotech where, you know, it's bringing more therapies to market, evolving um, as cancer also evolves, um, mm -hmm. but also the fact that how we're interacting within the healthcare space, much like how, you know, we, we shop on Amazon, the COVID really unleashed um, what is now being called health tech. And the the how we interact with doctors, how we interact with hospitals, that parts of the of parts of it can be done online, and it would be more effective to do so. It's certainly more cost effective. You probably need less doctor's offices if if people can can do certain parts of the of the transaction online. And so that has it's another pocket of opportunity that's actually you know COVID really accelerated. Um, but we see that again here, China was already ahead of that because you have companies that are quite sizable that had already been looking at how do we how do we limit the long lines outside hospitals in China because there really isn't in China the system is such that most people go to the hospital when they're sick whether it's with a cold or with cancer and so you have huge backups and it's highly inefficient and the government was looking for ways to make it more efficient so even before covid they were looking for ways to harness the the, the the opportunity set that the smartphone gives us that you know platforms like mm -hmm. WeChat can give to create um, telemedicine. And so they had the nuts and bolts of it before COVID. And uh, what COVID did was really to shift, quickly shift people into these platforms. And now we're trying to figure out, well, how do you monetize this? And so it's creating a very interesting opportunity um, that mm -hmm. we're, you know, we'll, I think we'll see that translated into other emerging market economies by other companies. And that again, creates a very interesting opportunity. Yeah, I, look, I think as you say that it just occurred to me, I mean, there, there's pharmaceutical, which we've covered, but I guess adjacent to it is, is this a medical technology yes. industry? Is that also happening on the fringes uh, beyond the yeah. main? I mean, I think one of the other things that is being explored increasingly, and, and I was actually looking at a potential company, a small company, I think just thinking of IPOing, is to leverage AI, right? I think one of the things that you have in, in the science process is you publish paper and there's a lot of papers published and the human capacity to retain all this information is, is limited. Whereas with AI, you can quickly go through all the publishings in uh, medical journals in the world mm -hmm. and, and find the type of information that you're looking for and harness that more efficiently. So really, again, speed up the scientific portion to get to drug therapies that could potentially work. There's also now increasingly data banks of all the types of data biomarkers um, that you can have of, of, of humans to understand, well, which ones are the ones I should target for this type of cancer? Um, and then the, the holy grail, if you will, is you know diagnostic companies and oncology diagnostic companies that are really trying to determine whether your probability of getting cancer is X percent and getting at you before you, it becomes you know stage four cancer, so early mm -hmm. detection of cancer. And so this is the the, the future where we're solving for the disease before it happens, especially mm -hmm. with chronic diseases. Because when you think about um, in the Chinese government, and they're, you know, th these are companies that you know, are already in, in public market, public equity markets in the US, uh, but in China, they really have, again, 
accelerate that and really invested in that because the Chinese government is one payer. And so the Chinese government is looking for ways to optimize this very high cost burden that they face and the potential mm. to really have early detection in something like cancer would obviously be helpful to be able to divert those funds more efficiently mm -hmm. into other other parts of the healthcare chain. So there's a lot, like I said, lots of pockets mm -hmm. of growth opportunity within the China healthcare mm -hmm. space. And I think a lot of it has been accelerated by COVID. And that's sure. really what, I guess, the positive of, of, of COVID. Mm. Um, Sarah, I, I know that uh, you don't just cover China or, or healthcare, you're, you're an emerging markets uh, portfolio manager. And I thought in, in this last few minutes, um, Mike, Mike, maybe perhaps pick your brain on, you know, the other big emerging market um, right beside China and India, you know, huge population, um, mm -hmm. I'd say fairly similar issues. Again, in, in the context when we talk about, you know, um, drugs and biotech and, and medical technology, um, what's happening in India? It, it, are we seeing a similar sort of opportunity set in India as well? Yeah, so India has, um, they've already already been a key a participant in the supply healthcare chain, but mostly in the more in the generic side. Um, you, you it probably is a little fact, little known fact, but most of our generic drugs uh, that we consume in the US are actually produced in India. And oh, wow, some, okay. Are, um, are Indian. Um, so, you know, your Teva, you have your Teva, which I think is one of the largest generic companies in the world, but a lot of the generic drugs that that um, that are consumed in the United States are from Indian companies. Most of the, you know, pharmaceutical companies I'm familiar with in India, you know, 50, 60 percent of their sales are are done in the U.S. So that's been a market that, that India's really taken control of. Um, mm. I can't say that we've had the talent pool come back to India as yet in the way we saw in China and there hasn't been the level of investment in creating uh, you know the next generation but it, it's it is happening there are companies like Biocon that are um, trying to play more the the generic part of the biological chain mm -hmm. so um, a branded uh, small molecule drug is called a generic a a branded if you will biological drug the corollary to a generic is called a biosimilar so Again, it's not an exact copy, so that's why you can't say it's generic because it's live cells. Mm -hmm. You can't exactly copy live cells. Mm -hmm. So um, there is companies in India that that are participating in that. Um, mm -hmm. Also in Korea, you have big companies like Celtrion that that do the same thing. So yeah. they they participate in the healthcare chain, but unfortunately not yet in the the higher value chain the sure. way China has has proactively moved towards. Um, but you know, it, it, again. India has been, you know, the, the talent shift hasn't quite happened as yet, or the high level of investment that you've seen China put forth into its healthcare space. Uh, but certainly it's a market where there's there's plenty of opportunity in other regards, as it's still one of the more, um, an emerging market, if you will. You still have people, mm -hmm. again, another component of why China has been successful is that while you still have an economy that's still emerging, I mean, per capita income in China is still, you know, less than twelve thousand dollars a year. So mm -hmm. it's still emerging, quote unquote. But because of its size, um, you you find a population pool that's quite, quite, very much like sure. a developed market with the capacity to spend on these drugs. So what the government can't pay for, people have to pay out of pocket. You don't quite mm -hmm. have that level of uh, wealth in India. In, right. in a more massive scale. So I think that's also a driver. Part of the demographic shift is that shift of that emerging middle class and China mm. is further along than India is. And that's why you see healthcare services, travel, those, you know, the, the next layer of services sure, really the next up in China, exactly. And India is just not quite there yet, but I would imagine, I, I don't doubt that, you know, if we have this conversation in five, maybe five years or so, maybe, We'll, we'll be talking a little bit differently about mm. what India has to offer on the healthcare side. Yeah, yeah. And I guess last, last question, you know, as, as you mentioned, uh, as China moves up, if you like, the value chain, um, so manufacturing generic drugs and, and the like, um, are, are there other so-called, uh, whether it's frontier economies or other emerging economies, like in Southeast Asia, that, that would come in to take that place? Is that how you see the, the market opportunity? Well, I mean, when it comes to biosimilars, you have, you know, you already have the Koreans and Indians participating. Um, what I see is more, what I think is interesting, and, and this is an interesting opportunity, you just joggled my brain, um, is is in 
when you think about that supply chain, so API is your active pharmaceutical ingredient. It's your basic foundation towards making a drug. Um, the Chinese, because of climate, they want to hit certain climate targets and they want to, and and because of COVID, people want local supply chains. So people are looking mm. at localizing API formulation. And in that mm. regard, India is a winner of that shift out of China into other right. markets. And you could potentially see other ASEAN countries participating in this opportunity. And I think that's, again, something as, as people try to figure out supply chain localization, I think something that came out of mm. COVID is China shut down. There, where do you get the API? Most of the APIs come out of China. India became a second, but then look at mm. what's happened now. India shut down as well because mm. of how mm. COVID has has progressed in that country, and and API is in, in some types of API are in short supply. And so the, the I'm sure pharmaceuticals already looking at a third and fourth, um, you know, different levels of backups in some countries probably looking to say how can i participate in this opportunity so it certainly creates an opportunity set just i think how the supply chain is going to shake out um, we're still in the early stages of how that's going to look in the over the next couple of years and so i can conceive of you know some asean countries um, being you know being able to participate in that opportunity outside of india and china good thank you very much uh, sarah and on that note thank you very much for sharing your thoughts it's been fascinating uh, you know, that nexus between pharmaceutical, biotech, and I guess the investment options here. And I think certainly if we get together in two or three years' time, there's lots more to talk about the, the progress. <laughs> of um, on that note, thank you very much. Uh, I oh, hope the you. audience that's with us uh, has, has uh, enjoyed this and it's been useful. And uh, again, we hope to uh, see you in another webinar. Thank you very oh, much and much. have a good day.